Okay, at this time it's 12.56. Recording has begun. Uh, we will start at 1 o'clock sharp. All right, we'll be we'll begin in about one minute. So I'm giving everybody a one minute warning. All right, it is um, one o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I first just want to thank everybody for being here today. Um, before we start with introducing panelists um, and talking about this topic, um, there are a few acknowledgments I wanted to make. Um, one is that um, Right now, today, we're not gathering physically at Stetson University, but we are a part of the Stetson University community. Um, and that Stetson University community resides on the traditional land of the Seminole and Timucua Native tribes, past and present. And um, I'd like to honor the Native tribes with gratitude. Um, and for, for those who are not familiar, um, 
it's important to acknowledge the land that we're situated on and the history um, behind that um, and how, how we got here today. And more than ever, I think it's important to acknowledge that, especially with the topic that we're talking about. Um, and so that, and I also wanted to recognize that today is the fourth anniversary of the Pulse nightclub shooting, um, where 49 people, innocent people lost their lives. Um, and so I'd like to introduce Sensei Morris Sullivan. He's one of our panelists, but we're going to start. Um, he's going to um, share a contemplation and a moment of silence in recognition of that. OK, so uh, to start, I'd like to invite you to close your eyes or otherwise look into your hearts. And just take a few nice deep breaths. And as you breathe in, notice any tension present in your body or your mind. And as you breathe out, just let that release and relax. And then take a moment to bring yourself into the here and now. As your breath settles into just a comfortable rhythm, orient yourself, where is here? When is now at this moment? And just leave anything else outside of here and now for the present. And find a place to rest your attention. It can be in a physical sensation like the way your feet feel resting on the floor or your breath at the nostrils. Or it can be a word something significant to you or not but make this your refuge if you feel tense or tight just come back to that feeling or that word and then let's take just a moment of silence for those lost four years ago today We surround all beings with the light and warmth of our love and compassion. Particularly, we send loving thoughts to those in suffering and sorrow, to those who are ill, to those who minister to the sick, and for all who are striving to right injustice. We send oceans of compassion to those grieving for loved ones lost to illness, to violence, and to any who are suffering from oppression. May they be serene through all their troubles. May the infinite light of wisdom and compassion so shine within us that animosity finds no place to stand in our hearts and that our actions be guided only by our brightest convictions. Thank you. Thank you, Morris. Um, <clears throat> so to start us off, I've um, and I'll repost it at the beginning of the conference. I um, shared some links. And the first one is actually a panel that took place last Thursday um, that was facilitated by Dean Alexandre. Um, and it really um, started this conversation. And so um, I encourage you all, if you haven't had a chance to watch that, um, the link is, is, posted, um, is posted there to watch. Um, I also wanted on the side, you'll see um, the Brown Center for Faculty Innovation and Excellence. They have an inclusive teaching resource page, um, which is a library that we're continuing to add to. So um, I encourage you all to visit that page um, as well as um, we have a sharing, a resource sharing document. It's like a, a library that people can add to 
And right now there are so many resources out there and um, I've received a, a number of emails from individuals um, with additional resources. So if there are resources that you have found helpful during this time, please go into that OneDrive document and add them. Um, if you're worried about the format, don't, don't stress about that. We'll adjust formatting. You can just copy and paste your, your information and we'll do that. So I'm going to go ahead and re-post um, these resources right now. Uh, and um, we'll get started. So um, the title of our session today is Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation as a Campus Community. Um, we've had the panelists and I have had a long conversation about um, about how we can cover this topic and do it justice in an hour and 15 minutes. Um, and so the Brown Center, um, which is being led by Harry Price, um is we're actually going to be doing um, a series of panels and so today's panel is going to really focus on that first word of truth um, and so our panelists will be responding to one question today um, and i'll share that question but before i do that i would like um, for each um, panelist to go ahead and introduce themselves um, we're so excited for you to be here um, especially in the virtual setting, um, we all talked about how we felt uh, we wish we could be in person, but this work is too important. So um, with that, I'm going to have Dr. Charmaine Jackson go ahead and introduce herself. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Charmaine Jackson. I'm an assistant professor in the sociology department. I've been at Stetson, uh, just finished up four years, and I uh, do research um, and teach in the area of race and um, systemic inequalities, looking at the social structure um, as a sociologist. Um, and more specifically, my research is also um, interested uh, in understanding the mechanisms that take us through through these these places, these injuries. So thank you. Thank you, Charmaine. I'm going to have um, Joanne Harris Duff go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Joanne Harris Duff. I am the director of diversity and inclusion, and I lead our cross cultural center on campus. I am starting my third year and I've been doing diversity and inclusion work since 1999. Thank you everyone for being here. All right, thank you, Joanne. Um, we'll go ahead and have our student representative, Melissa and Daye, um, please introduce yourself. I'm going to give her a moment to get to get on, but we'll go ahead and um, have. I know Sensei Morris Sullivan, you had a, um, you let us. Um, would you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, so I'm I'm Sensei Morris Sullivan. Sensei is my religious title. I'm a I'm a Zen monk, and I'm one of, one of two chaplains here, um, and uh, in the Office of Religious and Spiritual Life. So um, that's I've been here for about three and a half years. So that's, thank you. All right, and um, I'll have Dr. Harry Price, you'd introduce yourself. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, hello everybody, uh, so my name is Harry Price, uh, and I'm Associate Professor in the Department of Chemistry. I'm the um, newly appointed Faculty Director of the Brown Center. Um, and I'm, accept, I'm taking the baton uh, from uh, the very capable hands of uh, Nathan Wallach, who led the Brown Center as interim director over the past year. And I'm looking very much forward to doing some really great work uh, through collaboration with um, Joanne uh, and Savannah, uh, as well as the uh, four faculty, the Council of Faculty Fellows, uh, when they come online um, <clears throat> this coming year. Um, and so I think that today's uh, panel discussion, I hope that it sparks uh, some very deep reflection 
uh, and I'm really, really happy to see uh, that we have over 100 uh, people in the, that have joined us. So thank you very much. All right, and now I have Melissa. You can go Sorry, I was having yourself. technical issues with the audio. <laughs> Um, my name is Melissa Njai. I am the president of the Black Student Association at Stetson University. Um, I'm going into my junior year here at Stetson University, and I um, can't wait to get into the conversation um, with you guys. All right. So thank you all for introducing yourselves. We'll go ahead and um, get started. So. Um, just as a reminder for the panelists to um, put your, your microphone on mute if you're not speaking. Um, it just helps with, with the audio. Um, all right. So, um, again, I, I said that today we're really going to be focusing on the topic of truth. And um, the question that is being posed to our panelists um, is, what is the truth about racism in the United States and at Stetson University? I'll post this question in the comments section. And um, I'll ask Charmaine if you'd be willing to, to go first. Thank you, Savannah. That's fine. Um, so uh, I think um, where I'm going to go ahead and get us thinking about is the value of truth. Um, we use this idea of truth and reconciliation um, as a way to move through um, transgressions that have happened to us collectively, right? We are a collective um, group of people. We don't exist in isolation of one another. Um, we are social beings. And uh, when we experience oppression uh, at a group level um, by others in another group uh, context, uh, to think about ways in which um, we heal that collectively so we can move on. Um, and so I think the tendency tends to be uh, in, in these kinds of conflicts uh, for those who have been the transgressors of oppression, the perpetrators, uh, to get quickly to a solution and move on. Um, but for those who have experienced um, the violence, uh, bloodshed, pain and suffering at the hands, of um, those who oppress, uh, that ability to move on requires um, uh, certain sort of mechanisms. And one of those things that has been done, we've seen in other kinds of conflicts and has been called for um, by numerous scholars here in the United States, um, is to have uh, truth and reconciliation um, for, for historical events that we continue to be plagued by today. So one of the places uh, we began is truth, right? Um, and so uh, coming to terms with what is the truth of um, our situation. Um, and so uh, we can think of many ways in which um, our, uh, there might be expressions such as the truth shall set you free. Speaking truth to power. Um, the importance of having a voice, using a voice, the problem of silence. Uh, and so I think it is appropriate um, to think about truth um, and, how, and its role in healing. Um, and I argue that um, one person's truth, right, is connected uh, to my own truth. And my truth is in turn connected to your truth. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, uh, to kind of think about um, humanity, right? What it is what you do to me um, in turn is what you do to yourself. And what I do to others, I do to myself. Um, and so you can kind of think about this in order to perpetrate, um, let's say, murder. Um, you as a human being, right? If I were to do that, I would then have to um, take on, right, this role of murderer, what goes in embody that act as I go to strip you, right, of your life um, or in other ways in which that happens. And so uh, only by coming to truth, I articulate that owning my truth, owning everyone, owning their truth, that we can find our way through this um, and through back to our humanity. 
um, because of the things we do or and, and or experience, we stay stuck in those stories, in those patterns. Um, and there needs for that, uh, there to be an acknowledgement, right? And, and moving forward and sort of thinking about um, how do we go beyond here? Um, and so in talking about the truth of the United States, um, what is the truth of racism at the United States? You, this panel um, may provide some context, but there's plenty of resources out there um, happening uh, on social media, various outlets to talk about systemic racism. Um, what, is, what is the truth of America? Um, our historical truth is that uh, racism is built into the fabric of this nation. Um, and we can look at slavery, right? Slavery as, as one of the, the key pieces um, to how that has happened. Um, and so I charge too in having these conversations that we think beyond or go beyond sort of narratives around multiculturalism um, and or even using terms like people of color and talking about what is happening right now in the state of America, because it is not a we situation when it comes to who uh, is experiencing uh, the health disparities. If we look at the, uh, the COVID um, crisis, uh, it is in the black community, it's black Americans. It is black Americans that are um, experiencing um, murder by the police. It is, you know, black families that are uh, subject to separation. It is black children that have been um, further behind in educational um, attainment. And with, again, going back to the COVID piece, um, we have yet to see, sort of see the ways in which that uh, existing educational gap will continue to widen. Um, so we can talk about in terms of social institutions, society is comprised of social institutions. You have schools, education, uh, I'm sorry, that's the same thing, schools, um, healthcare, uh, the family, uh, politi politics. So we can go into the um, pri you know, prison system and look at the rates of incarceration and who uh, who do we incarcerate? Do we see the same representations across um, all groups, right? We look at the demographics of the country and we would expect if there was no inequality, um, all racial groups would be represented in the prison system equally and equal proportion to what we have in the population. But in fact, that is not what we see. We do that the same thing when we look at um, health outcomes and health disparities. Uh, so, um, how do we, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I know the school was talking a lot about legal action, voting action. Um, there are many ways to get um, really at the core. Um, but there is another component, um, and I, I would have to say um, gets less emphasis, and that is uh, the interactional component. Um, and I think there has been a tendency to move away from the interactional component. And what I mean by that in thinking about what comprises of society, uh, institutions, like I've just meant, are one way in which society reproduces itself so that we don't have to recreate ourselves every time a new generation is born or a generation dies. Um, but the other piece is people. Every time we interact with one another and engage, um, we have changed uh, each other, right? And so society is constantly evolving and um, in recent in recent times, um, I have a particular, you know, speaking of my truth, my truth here at Stetson, where I live in Deland, Florida. Um, uh, more recently, I had an interaction. I went out um, to visit. Uh, there's a lighthouse nearby, Ponce Inlet, and this was uh, on the week last weekend. And I'm out with my daughter, uh, walking around the grounds. And a white man um, with his partner, it appeared, um, a white woman, goes out of his way to smile at me and say, hello, hello. And I was, I found myself taken aback. And I said, hello. And he, you know, continued to be very excited to be able to say hello to me. And, um, 
And so we departed and I continued on, we went home. Later when I was reflecting on that moment, I realized there was a moment of sadness for me in that um, because I have no expectation that this man should ever do this because I have no experience with this kind of interaction. I had someone ask me, well, um, so you've never had a white man be nice to you. Not a strange white man in a public place. Not in, not in that capacity, right? Who isn't, who isn't, you know, whose job it isn't to serve me or to answer a question or we're conducting business. But just a random person on the street saying, hello, I see you. I welcome you. Um, and it, it made me really realize how much I go through my life not anticipating or expecting that response at all but perhaps a completely different response, having my guard up, being careful, and not because I'm paranoid, because I could continue on with stories of living in fear of um, uh, interactions with law enforcement. Um, you know, discrimination in stores, um, you know, continuing, uh, continuing on and on and on. Um, but what it brought up to me was, no matter how much legislation we pass, and perhaps we do live in a capitalist society, and once we have economic um, equality for all groups, particularly blacks, um, perhaps we will see blacks receiving better treatment. Of, co of course, that treatment would be motivated um, by economic gain. But what you can not legislate is attitude. Um, and so while I can live in a neighborhood where I might have been excluded as a black person or work in a workplace, um, right? So the law may say, uh, white people, you have to work with a black person. You have to live next to a black person. You have to serve a black person in that restaurant. Um, you have to send your children to a school uh, or you, ca you cannot segregate schools um, by race. Um, the experience of navigating through those spaces, uh, the ability to be made uncomfortable so you can live here, but uh, you know the community will do what it can to make sure you don't choose that, right? There are ways in which black people share amongst each other. Is a place safe? Is it safe to go to that store? Is it safe to live in that neighborhood? Is it a question of whether it's legal? It's perfectly legal to live wherever you want in this country, but would you? Would you want to work in a particular environment? What's it like to work there? Is it safe? I mean, there are these questions of safety and security. Um, and so, and these are specific experiences um, that are pervasive in the black community that we see expressed both nationally and then I can think about where I am locally. Um, and so I think that is why it is so important to share your stories. And in the sh story, um, in owning your truth, this is not just a truth of how I have been harmed, but it is also a truth of how one may have harmed. Harming is not happening without people. While institutions, yes, make it extremely hard for individuals um, to change or to move, right? Those, I'm not denying, those two forces are both at play and both need to change. Um, and so I, I do really charge, because I don't want my truth to be, I prefer to be comfortable at my daughter's expense. I prefer to be quiet because that quiet and that comfortable comes at my daughter and every child in the future's expense. Because our next generation and that next generation will have to live with our truth that we're willing to either recognize um, or deny. And I, I do not want to leave that legacy. I am living in a time in this moment in my, many blacks have talked about, particularly older blacks, older than me, um, things are better than when they were a child. And I can speak very pointedly, they are worse. The world is worse for me. The interactions, the way in which I move through this world, I am experiencing greater suppression than I did, than the world was when I was born. Um, and of course, we could talk about other categories in which things are worse off than the time I was born, but we're not here to have that. This conversation is focused around um, thinking about racism, thinking about anti-blackness, owning our truths and coming clean from that place so that we can then begin to do the work that is necessary. Um, and so that's that's all. all of
Thank you so much, Charmaine. Um, powerful words. And I just am grateful for you to be on this panel. Um, Joanne, um, I'm going to ask if you'd be willing to answer the question next. Um, so as a reminder, um, the question is, what is the truth about racism in the United States and at Stetson University? Hi again, everyone. Thank you, Savannah. So um, I've been thinking about this question, as everyone here can imagine, um, my entire life. Um, and I can tell you, uh, so at the beginning, I talked about how I've been doing this work since professionally since 1999. However, I went to my first protest with my parents, who were both Black Panthers, um, when I was five years old. That was in 1980. And that was my first impact that I could feel to my core. Um, in regards to anti-blackness. We were protesting lined across the streets in this little town called Bedford, Virginia, um, as the KKK marched through our main street because at the time they had the privilege to do so. Um, and then there that began so many things that happened in my life. Um, and so here in the now, I agree with Charmaine. It, I feel, I believe that it's worse. Um, it is so much worse. Um, I did not think in 1980 when I was five um, and throughout my life as a child that as an adult at 45, I would be having the same conversation with my children and also taking them to their first protest. And when I think about Stetson and professionally what's happening right now in our country, but um, obviously the world, but when I think about Stetson and what's happening on our campus and how it impacts um, us here in DeLand, the first thing I think about are the bias education support team um, experiences. I don't want to call them reports because it's not a reporting system, if you will, um, but it is a way for students to share some bias incidents that have happened on campus um, or even in the community. So, um, the, so the best group can work with students to navigate those issues um, to as we're talking about healing and truth, you know, how can we, how can we offer a space for students to share their truth um, and their experience, right? So we're in this space, um, and hopefully, from sharing truth and being able to voice what's happened um, to them and their experience, we can then there work towards some type of resolution. But resolution is, it's ever changing. We're, we're talking about systematic change, right? Not simply a resolution. Um, since George uh, Floyd's murder, I have received countless bias education support team um, incidents. And um, I've noticed when I'm getting these, for lack of a better word, I'm going to call them reports. So. As I'm getting these best reports and I'm inundated, I realize there is there's no way that I will be able to assist and resolve with the rest of our team these reports. And our uh, chairwoman of the Multicultural Student Council, Tahira Perry, and I have been talking about this at length. And she reminded me that students right now and some recent alums are not necessarily asking for um, resolution. Um, those who have been impacted by anti-Blackness, and I would venture to say that's nearly every person, whether or not we feel it quite yet or not. Um, she reminded me that people want to be heard this is a great opportunity in this, in this system 
the bias education support team for us to honor students voices who often aren't heard not don't feel like they're heard but quite frankly aren't heard and are invisible and we have been able i've been able to kind of switch my thinking and think about that how that impact will hopefully bring more awareness because with systematic change right so awareness starts and the hope is when we have some awareness it will lead then there to a desire to move forward towards gaining more knowledge what's scary about when some people bring awareness there's this fear so there's this fear often when you experience racism anti-blackness then when we become aware of it or we share that awareness and we voice how we feel whether that's a protest whether that is a best report whether that's having a conversation with someone whom we trust or in our family we're hoping that that desire will be a positive forward-thinking desire but then for me i think about the stories of Tulsa, Rosewood. Those are the things I think about because when there is acknowledgement of these beautiful, strong, uh, thriving black communities, the history is they've been burned. They have been burned, they've been destroyed. And if I think about that and I translate that to my, um, the impact that I have personally, I think about the my own desire when I have received, when I've been able to acknowledge black deaths by murder of police officers or other law enforcement community members. How does that affect me personally and that awareness? I have a desire from that but the desire is different as a mother. My daughter just turned 15. Today, she's going to the DMV. Because of Sandra Bland, she will not be driving when it's dark. She will always be driving with um, her driver's license where she can easily reach it. She will always have a registration where she can easily reach it. She will always have her insurance card where she can easily reach it because I do not want her to ever reach into a glove box when a police officer pulls beside her and that police officer thinks that she may be reaching for a weapon. And I think about my 11 year old son he does, he's a jogger, he's an athlete, he's a bit of a mathematician. How it's impacted me, anti-blackness, anti racism, he doesn't jog by himself in our community anymore. Either I jog with him or when he's really fast, I have to bike beside him, but never alone. And because of what happened with Tamir Rice, he will never play with a toy gun. I instilled that because of my desire to keep him safe when he was two, three years old. So if we bundle that all together and we think about how when we have awareness and the hope that then there, there's desire to move forward in a positive way. Our hope here today also is that we're able to encourage people to gain knowledge and learn more. And I would imagine that's why we're here. But when we gain knowledge and we're moving forward, we also hope that we gain the ability to continue to move forward. Um, and that doesn't stop with 
just having the ability to move forward. But I believe that we're in the midst of this beautiful revolution. And if we continue to enforce this revolution um, in our community at Stetson, we will, we are moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Um, not only for sharing your voice as the uh, director of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, but for sharing your voice as Joanne Harris stuff. Um, I really appreciate everything that you've that you've shared. Um, and now we'll, I'll go ahead and see if Melissa, if um, you're willing to share in response to the question. Um, of what is the truth about racism in the United States and at Stetson University. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to start off by saying it has been 56 years since the end of the Jim Crow era. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit emotional since um, Joanne speaking. It's been 52 years, it's the civil rights movement. Racism is nothing new in America. African Americans, other minorities experience racism on a daily basis. From birth, America already put a stamp on the facts of how we would be seen in this world. From our looks, to how we dress, to how we talk. We don't have the luxury to pre to be um, not to be prejudged, walk into a room. We don't have the luxury to when a police car drive behind us to feel safe and feel okay. We don't have the luxury to take a jog around the neighborhood. We don't have the luxury to sleep soundly in our homes. We don't have the luxury to be kids, to play cops and robbers. The truth about racism in America is Rodney King, is Malise Green, is Sean Bell, is Oscar Grant, is Trayvon Martin, is Eric Garner, is Michael Brown, is Tamir Rice, is Freddie Gray, is Ahmaud Arbery, is Breonna Taylor, and is George Floyd. That's the university has been my home for three years now. And this used to be the campus that hosts blackface shows in Elizabeth Hall. It has a rich history of racism um, on their campus. Even though that was in the past, students still today and the black community still experienced the prejudice and the racism. Some students experienced the racial slurs, the profiling, the feeling of feeling uncomfortable altogether. Um, feeling that we have to prove ourselves, we have to work in times harder just to be heard, just to be seen, just to be taken seriously. Racism how it um, impacts me is getting the talk, the conversation of how to be in America, of what to do and what not to do, of what to say or what not to say, how to act. Um, it's impacting me to see my brother that wants to drive and my fear in my mom's eyes. It impacted me that just only at six years old, me attend, um, going to a skating rink in my um, neighborhood, well, in the city, and lining up on the wall, giving high fives, skaters are coming by and having one white individual raise his hand right before he got to me. And he blatantly said, 
this is white people music. You don't know nothing about that. And me being a child, I didn't understand what he meant. All I knew it wasn't right. And I told my mom about it. And she made him apologize. But it's the fact that he said it. It's the fact he said it to a child. It's these past few weeks seeing all the posts, all the um, protests and everything. It was just astonishing that we're still doing this to this day, that we're still asking for justice, that we're still asking just to, just to stay alive, that we're still begging and pleading to be here. <laughs> And me as a student, me as an educated black woman, me going to a profession to help the mental health of my community, we need to step up and demand the change that we want to see. And we are doing that. And it's wonderful to see all the young people, all the old people um, doing that right now and i'm just hoping that we will see change that we are asking for and we will see the justice that we are asking for um that will conclude my statement melissa thank you so much for for being on this panel. Um, I mean, <clears throat> serving on a panel, a virtual panel is challenging in and of itself. And for you to be willing to come on as a student during your summertime, um, it, I just wanna thank you. Um, thank you for sharing your voice. Um, I, I think on behalf of everybody that's on, that's listening, um, your voice needs to be heard and um, and I really appreciate you. So um, with that, I'll go and um, introduce Sensei Morris Sullivan, um, who will be responding to the same question, which I will um, re read one more time. What is the truth about racism in the United States and at Stetson University? OK, well, thank you. Um, and let me just echo what you just said. You know, I I look back at, at my life, which um, as one of those old people that you mentioned, uh, you know, I see a number of times that we really could have done something to make this particular moment unnecessary. And hopefully uh, we'll do better now. But my first awareness of police brutality was in 1965. And I was nine years old when a riot began in Watts, which is a community in Los Angeles County, California. And that wasn't the first incident of its kind or even the first in my lifetime, but it was the first that I was aware of. And in that particular incident, there were a lot of related conditions and issues that led up to it. So there was a powder keg there, but the thing that lit the fuse was police brutality against a black male that started as a routine traffic stop and a roadside argument. But it laid bare a lot of related problems and I started to become aware of those things as the civil rights movement moved, uh, progressed. And I've actually seen a lot of progress in my life and that's one of the things that I have to remind myself from time to time. You know, I was around early enough to see segregated drinking fountains and restrooms and things like that. But uh, even as a kid, racism didn't make any sense to me. I'm a Buddhist now, but I grew up a uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant in Texas in predominantly white Protestant communities. And I actually stopped going to church because I thought equal rights was a good thing and the Baptist preachers and congregations that I saw felt otherwise. The tipping point for me came one Saturday morning when I was about 14 years old and I'd gone to church with my grandparents. And over dinner, my grandmother started talking about how a black family had shown up at their church. And my grandfather and the other deacons told them where the Black Baptist Church was and asked them to leave. And I said that didn't sound very Christian to me, and I was told to leave the table. Well, on the way home, I told my parents that I wasn't going to church anymore. And to their credit, 
they respected that. And that's probably what started me on the spiritual exploration that led to where I am now. But I've learned since that Christianity was even being Baptist wasn't the problem. In fact, I'm working on a history of religion and religious life at Stetson and Kelly Larson, the archivist, sent me some articles uh, from the Stetson Reporter, and among them were several about the Baptist Student Union, who way back in 1955 were pushing for Stetson to integrate. And I think it worked. I think uh, they started admitting black students in 1957. So as I lived through integration, I, I saw hope in the progress that we made, but at the same time, you see another incident, Rodney King protest or something like that, and I'd feel frustration at how slowly we progress. And now at this point in my life, I look current protests against police brutality on black males. And I have to say, you know, I find myself often thinking, really, we haven't fixed this yet? It seems like such an obvious thing of being a black male in America it just shouldn't be a capital crime. But at the same time, I realize that this is part of a bigger issue. We should deal with the problem at hand for certain. But for lasting effect, we need to address the bigger picture. And police violence against black males exists within a context that includes structural violence, laws and practices that allow law enforcement to do these things and make it hard to prosecute them, as well as political and social structures that restrict access to resources and education and health care. And we have to eliminate the cultural violence, things like the myth that black criminality, uh, for instance, and that things like that, that people in positions of power and privilege rely on to perpetuate the status quo. And that includes some deep seated cultural attitudes. And I think that will require us to question and change what we consider acceptable from people in power with regards to their ability to uh, basically go to war against Americans that challenge their power. As long as there are people who feel entitled to oppress others, we're going to have to grapple with that issue. And I think that that's one reason that this really should matter to everyone. I started thinking about this when the, the, the tear gassing incident happened. Um, I, I, got dear, I got tear gassed once myself and I wasn't doing anything particularly noble. I wasn't demonstrating for a worthy cause. The police just tear gassed several thousand people at a rock concert to get to a dozen gate crashers. And I was just there listening to the music. I didn't even know anything was going on until the house lights turned on. And I got hit with this cloud of tear gas and saw the cops in riot gear beating on people with clubs. Being tear gassed is really unpleasant, by the way. I don't recommend it. Um, but this could happen because people in power feel justified in escalating what should have been a law enforcement action into warfare, basically, against a segment of society that they saw as a threat. And I think that's not a lot different than a cop shoving a 75-year-old activist to the ground, political leaders excusing it by saying maybe he was a terrorist. It's very hard to create change if we're going to let ourselves be demonized and declared insurgents and things like that. But I don't mean to distract from the problem at hand. I hope that we can figure out as a society and as a community how to end racism against black people specifically and police violence against black men. And if not, I think that as a society, we have really big problems. So, I, you know, when talking about my truth, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that in my religion, we see human suffering as originating in three poisons greed, hatred, and misunderstanding. And we call these things poisons because they lead, lead to spiritual death by poisoning our minds and hearts. And so for me personally, that's a guiding truth. Unfortunately, part of our society right now seems to think that these poisons are virtues. And that's a shame because when we allow those things to dominate our hearts, they can ruin our society. And especially anger. There's a saying that appears over and over again in Buddhist scripture in different forms conquer hatred with non-hatred. Anger is never appeased by anger. Hatred can never be defeated by hatred. And that sounds kind of abstract. Maybe, you know, it's a lovely thought from ancient wisdom from a guy with a Buddha statue behind him, but maybe it's not all that practical. But I've seen that principle at work in my own life. I was a victim of racial violence myself once black on white. When I was just out of high school, a friend, of I, a friend and I were working together 
and we stopped at a convenience store in a predominantly black part of Orlando to ask for questions, and we were assaulted in the parking lot. So I wasn't hurt, not really, but if I'm being honest, I have to say that that stained my perception for a while. I had the good sense not to let it make me hate anyone. In fact, I remember saying to a friend afterward, I guess that's what it's like to be the wrong color in the wrong neighborhood. But the fact that I could understand and even empathize with my attackers didn't make it okay. My friend had a concussion and still suffers from problems from that all these years later. And he didn't turn into a white supremacist or anything, but he's not the ally that I believe he probably would have been were it not for that incident. So I mentioned this just to encourage us to be careful when anger arises and how we respond to it. You don't have to have to hit somebody over the head with a big metal flashlight like happened to my friend to lose them as an ally. You can do it with words. But look, when I saw that video of that policeman with his knee on George, George Floyd's neck, I felt like going out and punching a cop myself. And I think it's natural and human to feel that. I think if you're a decent, compassionate human being, you have to have a response, something like that. Compassion for someone harmed is often accompanied by anger at the person doing the oppressing. But we don't have to nurture those feelings and we can avoid generalizing them to everyone of a certain color or everyone wearing a certain uniform. And Charmaine pointed out earlier something and she said, what I do to another, I do to myself. And that's important. If I'm perpetuating hatred against someone else, I'm perpetuating anger in my society. So get angry, but don't let anger decide what you do. Use that urge skillfully to cause meaningful change that will last after you've stopped being angry. And this is kind of related to my big fear. When we get angry, we get worked up, then we demonstrate our unity, and then we feel like we've done something and we go about our business. And then it happens again, and we wonder if we accomplished anything. But if we understand the continuum of this through history, we can see, number one, that change really is possible, and it does happen. And second, we can determine that what we do now, if we're intentional about it, can create a wave of change that continues into the future. I got an email this morning from an activist, Valerie Carr, and she was asking, how, how can we use this moment to go from being a resistance movement to reimagining America? And I think that's a really good way of looking at this. I think that's what this is going to take, reimagining America. And we can start by reimagining ourselves, first by looking seriously at this question, what is your truth? and then begin to reimagining the Stetson community that we live in. So this is my hope that we start something today that will live on long after I'm gone. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Morris, for your wise words. I really, um, reimagining America, reimagining Stetson um, and what, what it could look like um, really stuck with me. Um, so now I'm going to introduce our final uh, panelist, um, Harry Price. And um, the question that is being posed again is, what is the truth about racism in the United States and at Stetson University? Thank you, Savannah. Um, I'm going to leave my camera off because I want to be heard as the voice of a black man. Uh, specifically the voice of a 56-year-old black man who has <clears throat> had the great privilege of being able to navigate multiple worlds. Um, <clears throat> everything that has been said um, by the panelists preceding me has been heartfelt and it's touched me uh, in a number of ways, as I'm sure it has uh, touched the participants that are the people who have joined us this afternoon. And I only have a few minutes, to t and it's impossible for me to compress my life's experiences with regard to what is the truth to me with respect to racism in the United States and at Stetson University. It's impossible. This is an extraordinarily difficult conversation for me to have because <clears throat> I have to, if you consider a compass and you have the, the 
north, south, east, and west points on the compass. If you replace those with a different descriptors such as thinking and action and emotion, for instance, just three of, the, of those ordinal points. I have to remain, I have to actively work to remain in the thinking, intellectual portion of the compass and not be overcome by the emotional or the, 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 the action-oriented components of, of, of what I feel. Everything that I have seen, everything that I have uh, experienced in my life growing up uh, in, in the area of Chicago, the son of parents who grew up in Mississippi and Florida, <clears throat> a segregated society, um, being one of six siblings who were equivalently the first generation to emigrate as part of the ending portion of the great, great migration from the south into the north. And growing up in the north, I, I, I have not been able to escape at some level um, the consequences, the actions, the consequences of racism. But what I've learned throughout my experiences, and it's partly because it's how so many black people are raised, and again, I am not, I am intentionally not using the moniker of African American or Black American. I'm speaking as a black person. I I come from, and we all know this, but can we truly feel it in your bones, feel it in your soul that you are are a member of a group of people who have had to survive by fostering a level of mental toughness, physical resiliency that is, is you, you, you can't explain that to people. You can explain it, but it can't be transferred unless a person has had that shared experience. And I can say that the truth for me about racism in the United States and at Stetson University is that it is present in, in, a, in a gradient, a kaleidoscope of, of levels. And people would, one reason I'm, I haven't shown my face again is that people see me and they know me and they get, they have an appreciation of my disposition and how I conduct myself, et cetera, et cetera. But you would never, never have a sense of what it's like to walk down a high school hallway after being transferred to a high school that has 2,000 students and there are 25 black students and to be literally picked up and thrown through a window one month into transferring to that school and then having being forced to aggressively offend yourself after being thrown through said window and then being kicked out of school for two weeks, suspended for two weeks. And your father comes to pick you up and he just looks at me and he says, were you defending yourself? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, then that's all we need to talk about. Would you, would you appreciate what it's like to go on a backpacking journey after you uh, graduate for college to get your head together and you're, you're, you're on a Greyhound and you're, you're, you're fine. You're just, you're just traveling across the country alone because you can, you should be able to. And you stop in a, in a, in a, in a bar, in a, in, in a, in a, in a quiet town in Montana, just to have a beer because you just came off of, of, of two weeks in the back country, living in a tent, 
carrying all your food and everything. Just serve, just enjoying the world. Person pours you a beer. All you want to do is drink that beer. Minute later, somebody comes charging over the bar, knocks you to the floor, and tries to bang your head off the off a concrete floor because you're black. And this person thinks you're going to take their daughter from them. This is insane. It, it goes on and on and on. De de defending my thesis. The night before I defend my PhD dissertation to get become a PhD in chemistry. University of Illinois, Chicago, 1990. I'm walking down the street. I'm dressed. It's a little, you know, a little chilly outside, whatever. Walk past the restaurant and this woman yells from across the street, excuse me, boy, excuse me, boy, are you a valet? Can you take my car? And, and, what, and what's my response? I, lo I lost control. And I said from across the street, do I look like a fucking valet? And what went through my mind was I should have taken her car and taken it to the projects right around the corner and whistled and said, boys, it's all yours. Get the blocks, jack it up. But I didn't. I could go on and on and on, but I've been raised and many, uh, you know, we've been raised in a way to again, have this level of resilience and figure out a way to straddle both worlds. I am a black man. I have, I, I am, I've been married to a white woman who I love deeply for, we've been together for 30 years, married for 25. I navigate and I feel absolutely comfortable navigating in different worlds. At the same time, I'm always aware of who I am and who my, what my, you know, where my culture, my culture. Sorry, I'm getting a little worked up here. I see things that other people don't see because I've been, I've, I've been raised, if you will, by society to be observant, observant so that I can remain aware of what's happening around me, to be safe, observant. And I, believe it or not, I'm an expert at people's body language, observant in how people talk to me, observant, I, all sorts of levels of observational skill. And one thing I see is that While we have made some progress, enormous progress relate relative to what my parents or my grandparents and definitely what my great grandparents uh, experienced, we have taken significant steps backwards and that really frightens me. To, to hear what the students have told me about things that have in, that have occurred to them, their experiences, students of color and black students at Stetson, what they have told me and what they have shared breaks my heart. To see what's happening in our cities in response to this 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 disgusting political environment that has been and and, and, and and racially charged environment that we have that find ourselves that we find ourselves living in do most notably in no little part to our current president breaks my heart it, it makes me sick but I'm resilient right I expend so much energy just trying to keep myself intact as a person.
and not let my rage, as Al <clears throat> James Baldwin states, em emerge and come to the surface. But it's there. It's always there. And like the Hulk, I try to, I have to, I have to compartmentalize. And so what I would like to just say in closing um, is that as we proceed, really ask yourself. Think about it like the man in the high castle by Philip Dick. Think about this. What if the tables were turned? What if the tables were turned? What would it really feel like? What would it feel like to just be doing something like everybody else? And yet, you know people are looking at you. You get in an elevator and you know people are sizing you up. What are you going to do? Or, oh my goodness, you're a PhD or, oh, I would never have imagined that you would do this or you would have those interests. How much energy it takes to navigate through a world, through a society, which has created a, a system that perpetually, both overtly and sub, subversively, de demoralizes devalues a person because of the color of their skin. And with that, I, I have to say, I can't, I can't say any more because we don't have much time, but if, if these series of panels are going to mean anything, today's panel, I hope, sets the tone for the emotional discourse that is going to have to occur and that will hopefully lead to some tangible changes to make our institution an institution that is genuinely and more inclusive and observant of the of of, of the of the essential nature of diversity. Thank you. Harry, thank you so much. Um, thank you for for sharing your experience. And, um, and I've been kind of monitoring the comment section. And I know at this time, we want to we want to see action happen. We want to talk about what those action steps are. Um, but it's so important to hear our community and our community members and each person on this panel is a member of our community. And we need to listen to their stories and we need to come together as a community and figure out how we can heal from this. Um, not only, you know, in the United States, but at Stetson University. Um, and so this is, is our first step. Um, and I am going to be sharing. Okay, I'm sorry, my audio just, I don't know if it just went out. So I'm gonna start over, but I wanna thank you, Harry, so much for um, for your words and sharing your experience. Um, I've been monitoring the comment section and right now, more than ever, I wanna see, uh, I, we wanna see action and, um, but, hearing each other's stories. Everybody on this panel is part of the Stetson community and we need to listen to each other and hear, hear our stories. And I've just posted um, in the comments section um, an audience participation question that is an uh, anonymous um, 
you don't, your name won't be attached to your post, but we, we'd like to ask you how you've been impacted by or participated in black, anti-blackness and systemic racism. What is your truth to this question? Every person in, at Stetson University and in our world in, in the United States has participated in this in some way. Um, and we wanna hear your voices. Um, we, want to, we want to move to a place where we can heal as a community and come up with action steps to make our community better. Um, and so our future panels will focus on racial healing and on transformation. Um, and we are at 2.11, so we do have time for questions. Um, and so just a few minutes, we might go over, but I do want to um, open up um, in the comments to see if there are questions. So. While I look at this, waiting for questions, this panel is being recorded and it will be posted on the Brown Center um, for Faculty Excellence and Innovation website, as well as the Office of Diversity and Inclusion website, hopefully by Monday. Um, and the responses to the question that we've asked the participants, um, we'll, we'll be sharing those. They are anonymous again, so your name isn't attached to it unless you put your name on it. Um, and so I'll wait, okay. Um, one question I see, what is some advice you have to help someone comfort friends who have experienced racism? Can you repeat? Yeah, Can yeah you repeat it is. Um, what is some advice you have to help someone comfort friends who have experienced racism? If anybody's gonna, uh, I'll answer that if it's okay. So I think that, you know, someone who, if you wanna comfort somebody, there's any number of ways to do it. Sometimes it's, and I'm not saying that uh, I'm a counselor or anything like that, cause I'm not, but sometimes just listening and having empathy and potentially thinking about what you say to respond because everybody wants to help, right? But sometimes people don't need to hear, I'm, I'm so sorry, that's so wrong. They know it's wrong. They know you're, you're sorry because you're there with them. And it sounds, you know, counterintuitive, but sometimes, and again, this is just my opinion, sometimes what really helps is when a person says, I don't know what to say. I'm at a loss for words. I can't imagine how that must feel. I can't imagine how you deal with this and yet remain civil. It's, you know, just one, one thing. Do any of the panels, Charmaine? Um, I just wanna add on, and thank you, Harry, absolutely. Um, and sometimes uh, I think what also can be helpful is acknowledgement, is simply to say, I believe you. I believe you, not an excuse, not a, this can't happen, or what did you do? How did you contribute? All of this, this disconnection to the reality that someone is experiencing, but rather to say, I believe you. I believe you, I hear you, and I see you. That's all I have. Joanne has your hand raised. There you go. I think that um, something that I appreciate um, when I have experienced and I've experienced countless, I, I can't even begin to count the amount of racism that I've experienced overtly, microaggressively, so many forms, but 
when I heard Harry talk, it reminded me that sometimes when someone is sharing a story and they're being incredibly vulnerable, it's okay for your friend to be angry. So allowing a space where your friend can be angry and share thoughts and words that may take you aback, but know that that anger is coming from so much sadness and fear and making that space um, open and um, safe. All right. Um, I'm going to, because we're, we're running out of time, we're out of time, but I do want to end on one, one of the questions that was um, asked and feel free for other panelists to respond to the previous question. But what are the next steps for Stetson? How can we get involved in making Stetson better? Um, so if any of the panelists have a response to that. Savannah, I'd like to take a stab at that one. I think that um, the first thing we need to do is allow um, our community to speak their truth. And I think that should come from students first. Um, someone shared here a Twitter feed um, that students shared their voice in a Twitter feed. Um, also, um, I shared with you that there are numerous best reports. Melissa also shared with you the, the, the stories that are coming from um, her friends and people who are alums, but that is the first Thing we need to do, I believe, is hear students and, again, be open to students' vulnerability and anger. Melissa, you can go ahead. Um, just to add on to um, what Ms. Joanne was saying is after acknowledgement the next step should be actually taking actions, have plans and laws or some, something set in place for when a student does um, experience prejudice or, or is being discriminated against. That person that done that action actually get the consequences of that action. Um, not just sending in a report and it just be in the back of somebody's mind. I want to actually see them, you know, just, I want them to know what they have done was wrong. I want them to acknowledge that. So I think the next step is just actually take your actions and have things set in place for students so they can feel comfortable to come to someone if something was done to them unjustly. And they don't have to just suppress it and just like, okay, just another day. They can actually believe that Stetson have their back and something will be done about it. And um, that's what I'm hoping to bring as the new president of BSA is um, to be the voice of those people. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Melissa. Um, any, oh, we got Charmaine. Go ahead, Charmaine. Charmaine, are you there? I'm here. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I appreciate the, the two comments um, that preceded this. And I would also charge that we also need to think as an institution at the institutional level, administrative and faculty level, um, is what, what behaviors are we modeling um, and, and what behaviors are we uh, sort of encouraging? right, through our um, structural components. Um, so also to think about how we can model uh, the right kinds of behavior um, or what are we modeling really is, you know, how does, how does our example 
um, as the leadership of this institution then trickle down to what we see happening um, for the students as well. So I just wanted to add one more uh, final comment. Thank you. Thank you, Charmaine. Um, so we are, are out of time, um, but I just want to thank each of our panelists today um, for, for your time, for your, um, for your perspectives. Um, it takes a lot of courage to, to come and, and have this discussion. And I just want to thank each, of, each and every one of you. Um, as, um, as a reminder, this session is being recorded. We'll be putting it on both the Brown Center website and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion website, hopefully posted by Monday. Um, we're also taking the responses to the, um, the question we asked the audience, um, and we'll, we'll share those um, along with that um, link to the recording. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and close our session, and thank you all for participating today. We'll be in touch with, um, with our next panel discussion. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. It's a, it's a big first step. Much appreciated. Thank you, everyone.